you for joining us for today's French American Foundation webinar. It is our Young Leaders Perspectives webinar, which brings together our young leaders community to talk about um, topics of, of mutual concern. So today's webinar is Jumpstarting the Economy After COVID-19, Local and National Concerns. And we are very lucky to have with us Jason L. Kubi and David Vaillant. And they are both uh, young leaders from the class of 2017. And I will say a few words to introduce each of them. Um, so Jason El Kubi is Executive Vice President of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. And in this role, he serves as the number two executive for Virginia's State Economic Development Authority and oversees activities related to economic competitiveness, international trade, incentives, research, and operations. And prior to that, he was uh, the lead at One Acadiana, a nonprofit organization in Louisiana. David Vaillant uh, is BNP Paribas' Asset Management Global Head of Finance, Strategy, and Participations, which he joined in October of 2019. David joined from BNP Paribas Corporate and Institutional Banking Division, where he was Head of Banking for EMEA. And he's advised some of the group's most transformational transactions, including the acquisition of Fortis, and has been a significant contributor to the BNP Paribas franchise across Europe and emerging markets. So thank you both. We're in great company. And I will hand it off to you both. Great. Uh, well, Katie, um, thank you for that introduction. Thanks to everybody uh, on both sides of uh, the FAF uh, uh, partnership for organizing this event. I've been able to participate uh, as, a, um, as a listener to many of the prior ones and they've been terrific. And uh, I wanna thank everybody for those as well. Um, I was especially excited to do this when I learned that uh, I would have the chance to do it with, uh, with a dear friend uh, and uh, French American Foundation young leader uh, classmate, uh, David. So David, it's so great to be with you today. Um, uh, maybe uh, maybe to kick it off, uh, you can talk a little bit about the uh, the impact, uh, particularly the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, I can give some U.S. perspective, and we can take it from there. Thanks, thanks, Jason, and likewise, I was I was actually very glad to to do the seminar and to do it specifically with you. So thanks to the to the FAF for giving us that opportunity, and and hi to all our friends on the other side of the of the screen. Um, so maybe I'll kickstart indeed on, on what are the challenges that, that governments and businesses are trying to address. And in a certain way, Europe um, came to that a little bit ahead of the U.S. So uh, we faced some of the challenges a bit earlier. And to me, what's important is to understand that there are several, several sequences to, to, uh, um, to the economic challenges. Because from, from Jan onwards, uh, we faced an initial shock that was external because Europe was not affected yet, which was a supply shock as there were constraints on external suppliers and a demand shock as there was lower external consumption, so exports decreased, right? Notably in luxury tourism and so on and so forth. Then there was another wave, which was in Fed March uh, when Europe was hit by COVID. And then it was an internal shock of, of a much broader, much different magnitude, both on the supply side as constraints on suppliers in other European countries, but also as, as we started confinement. So basically factories stopped um, and clearly a lower demand, uh, notably in services. So there are two waves. And then there's possibly a third level of impacts, which we're starting to see now, uh, some of which were the financial markets, obviously, uh, but we're also seeing a rise, or we may see a rise in defaults on credit from, from SMEs notably, but not only. And we're also going to face a rise in public spending. So, and that is partially happening now, and that's partially ahead of us. Now, if we look at what are the impacts, and, and we can come back to that when, when you discuss it or during the Q&A, um, I mean, the first, the first kind of impact, the most immediate one, is the rising employment and, and more employees being furloughed as well, uh, which obviously depends on, on how countries uh, responded to that and with this level of social protection. And obviously that's more pronounced in the US uh, than, than, than in Europe. Then you have a reduction of wages depending on the level of an employment benefits, which is probably not the most massive uh, impact. 
Um, and actually you have forced savings because people are consuming less while their revenues are not that impacted in countries where you have high level of social protection. And the second point is what happens to companies and companies so both supply problems as they simply could not open and others saw demand. But most of them saw uh, basically two things. First of all, the immediate, the, the immediate problems that came, that ar ar arose, were, were around cash, so cash availability, which is a sort of treasury problem, uh, to which governments had to respond very quickly, and banks as well. And then on a more medium-term basis, uh, the issue is more dwindling revenues and as a consequence more solvency kind of problems and a reduction of, of profits. And maybe the last thing I say is, at least in Europe, uh, countries came into this crisis with very different features. So for instance, Germany had low debt to GDP, um, about 60%, Italy had 135. So the ability to respond was not the same but also the unemployment levels were very different. And again, Germany was around 3%, pretty much like the US. Spain was around 14, France was around eight. So um, the reason why the countries are not gonna be the same outside, uh, coming out of the crisis is also because they were not the same coming into the crisis. And, and I believe the US also have, have different features. So very happy to have your, your, your views on this. Yeah, that, well, first of all, that's that's a terrific overview. I would one, one thing that I would just add is that, um, and you you know more about economic crises than than I do, but my my sense is that one of the things that's somewhat unique or at least unusual about COVID is that um, governments, businesses were dealing with both a sort of supply side economic crisis and a demand side economic crisis uh, at the same time. You know, on the supply side, yeah. uh, companies uh, having trouble getting. Um, um, uh, components, supply chain uh, elements, uh, particularly from Asia in the early days of the crisis, but also particularly once the lockdown began, we saw a significant demand side crisis with a drop in consumer spending that rippled really across the economy. And I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what that looked like uh, in the U.S. to contextualize this uh, a little bit. I would, I would assume that uh, you, would, you would see similar things in other countries that have gone through a lockdown. The numbers will obviously change somewhat, but, um, but in the U.S., uh, most of the uh, uh, anal analysis I've seen suggests that there was a very sharp contraction in U.S. GDP uh, in the second quarter. So starting uh, in, in April, um, down uh, on the order of 32 to 42 percent, uh, with uh, expectations for a very sharp uh, 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 growth in, in GDP coming back from that decline um, in, in the third quarter of this year, the quarter that we're in uh, um, uh, today. Um, excuse me, yeah, the quarter that we're, we're now in today. Um, altogether, roughly 20 million jobs lost. Uh, forecasts suggesting that we probably are not going to get back to the pre-COVID-19 baseline uh, for jobs in the United States until the early part of 2023. Uh, that's about, you know, three years or so. Um, the lockdowns, as I mentioned, uh, caused a sharp drop in consumer spending on the order of 10 to 15 percent in April, which was the uh, you know, sort of the biggest lockdown month in the, in the United States. Very hard hits in, in certain sectors, obviously travel, uh, child care related uh, uh, expenditures way down, retail expenditures, transportation, health and beauty. Uh, so those sectors and people who work in those sectors very uh, heavily impacted. Uh, there were some, um, some sectors that were sort of winners in this, if you will. Um, the big one was uh, specialty food and beverage, which I believe includes <laughs> liquor sales. Um, <laughs> in, addition, uh, in addition to that, a, a lot of uh, spending on homes, uh, obviously groceries, also uh, things like hobbies uh, and so forth were way up. Um, you know, when you look at these impacts, it's important to consider that there were actually just three particular industries that accounted for the majority of unemployment uh, in the United States. Uh, that was so more than half. So um, uh, those three industries are accommodation and food services, which would be like hotels and, and restaurants, uh, the retail sector generally, and also um, somewhat surprisingly, healthcare. Um, you know, even though there were a lot of people seeking care for COVID, a lot of other elective procedures and so forth, preventative healthcare was way down. And when you consider, you know, who's in those industries, the, the types of workers, there were about half a dozen mostly low wage job uh, uh, categories or occupations that really bore the brunt of this uh, economic uh, crisis. 
uh, people who worked in food preparation and serving, so restaurant workers, uh, administrative folks in offices, salespeople, uh, personal care providers, uh, transportation folks, mostly uh, low wage uh, jobs, also uh, disproportionately folks who had less than a four year college degree, um, somewhat tended towards uh, people who were non-white. Um, and the other thing that's interesting to point out here is that as you look across uh, different states and regions of the United States, you see some big differences in terms of the depth of the economic uh, impact. Uh, some states saw, you know, unemployment um, uh, losses go up um, relatively modestly. Others, particularly states that were that are that are heavily invested in energy and tourism uh, uh, sectors saw some very, very large uh, increases in un unemployment for, um, for reasons that you would expect. I important to point out that when you look at the major super sectors of the economy, uh, all of them uh, are, are down. And so, you know, obviously this, this sort of sets the context, but also suggests just the magnitude of what uh, businesses and governments uh, around the world are responding to. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Jason. I was wondering, um, Clearly, there were there was there were different uh, responses from from public authorities and governments globally to to this crisis, um, and specifically to jumpstart the economy. I think that there were also different different reactions and different reactions on on the healthcare crisis per se. Um, we saw that certain countries like France responded fairly quickly uh, with with relatively bold measures, and not only France but, but various European countries. Um, how did you, the U.S., respond in comparison? What sort of worked, what didn't work, uh, at least from from what you can see with limited hindsight? Yeah. Well, I think we're still we're still you know sort of learning the answer to that question, and it'll be fascinating to sort of read the, the history on this in a in a few years. But um, I would say the first the first thing that comes to mind, David, is that um, the the U.S. federal response was very rapid, and it was very big. Um, in, in previous crises, we've seen Congress um, delay, debate, and so forth. The, um, the, the speed to action here was, um, was um, I don't want to say unprecedented, it may be unprecedented, but it was very, very fast um, and, and impressive in that respect. And it was also very, very large. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, you'd have to basically look back to the Great Depression of the 1930s to see, you know, a similar uh, level of, of government uh, action uh, to respond to um, to an economic crisis uh, in the United States. Um, and, and I should say that, you know, th this does create some concerns, uh, particularly longer term, about uh, the capacity of, uh, of government, particularly the federal government, to address some of the other big problems that are out there um, in the United States and in other countries. You know, you think of things like climate, uh, the, 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 the investment we need to make in, in our country's infrastructure. Hopefully we can talk about some of that. But in terms of, in terms of what uh, the government did, I mean, the, this is a, um, this, you know, th there, there are a very, very long list of the trillions of dollars that, um, that the U.S. government used to respond to this crisis. I'll, I'll try to be very brief here um, uh, because it's easy to, you know, get into a laundry list. But um, there was a major uh, investment in bolstering the social safety net um, in response to COVID. So um, uh, in, in the U.S., uh, we have uh, uh, an unemployment insurance system. Uh, typically, um, unemployment benefits cap out on the order of $300 or $400 per week. Um, one of the biggest parts of the federal relief package was to provide a $600 per week supplement to un unemployment insurance, which is to say that that $600 would be on top of that, you know, two or three or $400 that you would normally get. And one of the interesting effects of this, by the way, is that for many of those low wage workers that I described earlier, people who were working in restaurants, people who were working, you know, in retail sales jobs and so forth, in many cases, um, when they got those $600 weekly supplemental checks uh, during unemployment, they were actually seeing a net increase in their, um, uh, in their in income as a result of that. Um, uh, also, uh, the federal government uh, provided uh, multiple business loan programs. Uh, the most, uh, the most uh, significant and widely used one is something called the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, which provides up to $10 million per business uh, to help them get through uh, uh, this, uh, this economic downturn. 
Um, it can be used, that money can be used for a number of things, but uh, the, the primary intent is to use it to sustain uh, payrolls, uh, to keep people uh, employed. And um, uh, to the extent that companies do that, uh, the, the PPP program provides essentially a forgivable loan uh, if it's used for, uh, for those uh, eligible expenditures, which include also things like rent uh, and utilities. Uh, there were a number of other business, pro business loan programs uh, that were provided, but that was uh, the, the single biggest one. It was just extended, by the way, uh, this week. Um, also, there, were, there was a wide range of mostly state-level governmental relief programs and grants. So, you know, a laundry list from, you know, agriculture to economic development to healthcare, uh, uh, grant and relief programs provided mostly to states. And I, I would say, you know, probably the single biggest question mark right now and the single biggest unsolved problem in many ways is at the local government level. Um, uh, in the United States, local governments uh, provide um, uh, the overwhelming share of uh, primary and secondary education expenditure. Um, they also uh, are, are major providers of infrastructure. Uh, you know, when you think of infrastructure, you know, you often think of sort of rail and, and roads and things like that, but think about, you know, sort of sewage systems and, you know, municipal mm -hmm. wastewater treatment and things, Th those sorts of things are provided by the local government. Local governments are very stressed right now uh, financially. Uh, many of them have not fully recovered from the Great Recession uh, of 10 years ago. And then, and then finally, and this, this is an area that you tend to know more about than me, David, but, you know, there's been uh, unprecedented action also by the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, uh, lowering rates, providing forward guidance to indicate that rates will be kept low until the economy is on better footing, quantitative easing, uh, and other measures. So a very big and, and unprecedented uh, response, but also a crisis of, uh, of unprecedented magnitudes. Yeah. Oh, you, you're, you, you perfectly described. In, in a lot of ways, we, uh, we redis what I take out of the crisis is as you said, most governments react fairly quickly. Um, and I think that's uh, one, also one of the consequences of the great crisis we, we, we faced 10 years ago, which is during which there was, there was a bit of, uh, of, of latency in reacting. Uh, this time governments in most developed countries have reacted fairly quickly, mm. also because they saw the cost of, of not responding properly. And I think we've seen also um, a form of Keynesianism coming back to the forefront. And if you look at what most countries did, you can sort of put things in, in four buckets. Um, one is additional healthcare spending, directly or indirectly, notably in, in countries with, with a very strong public um, healthcare, healthcare system. Then support for business cash flows, which is sort of the immediate need was was to provide businesses, notably SMEs, with with immediate cash so that they wouldn't go belly up. And then when there's foreign loans, but also a deferral of tax and social security payments and so on and so forth. Um, then came uh, support for businesses in the form of guaranteed loans and capital injections, because as, as the crisis lasted a bit longer and, and, and weeks after weeks, um, businesses started to have um, solvency problems, not only cash problems, which required to, to provide them with equity uh, in a lot of ways or quasi-equity. And then the support for households, largely through short-time working, which you, you described, and, and again, in a lot of ways. And, and this could go you know, to, to levels of 20% of GDP if you add all of that, which is, which is really unprecedented. Um, and I think most European countries followed that pattern, pattern whether that's France, Germany, Spain, Italy, had those four pillars. What's interesting, and, and we'll discuss probably governance in a few minutes, but what's interesting is that um, we need to bear in mind that European countries don't have an independent monetary policy anymore mm. because that monetary policy is actually now with the ECB, so a European-wide um, uh, decision maker. Um, so the fiscal policy and some of the structural policies where we're really the the crux of the matter for, for European countries, and they're quite akin to what the U.S. did in, 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 in broad terms. And then on, on the monetary side, I think both, both uh, central banks reacted in a very coherent way, in a lot of ways, by, by basically extended credit. 
um, and, and both saw their uh, balance sheet increase dramatically, which is probably one of the issues that we're going to have to deal with going forward because uh, the Fed's balance sheet went out, you know, 2.8 trillion. So it's actually absolutely, absolutely gigantic. It's now larger than the balance sheet of the ECB, if I remember correctly. So um, we, we're now, I think, one of the one of the questions that we'll have to face out coming out of the crisis is we'll have uh, uh, obviously um, impaired growth, uh, but also uh, much higher debt to GDP mm -hmm. and much more money in circulation with with increased balance sheets on the side of the central bank. So that's to me one of the the questions we'll have to deal with going forward. Um, what would be very interesting to hear from you, and notably because the structure, um, the governance of the countries are very different, is is now that that the countries are how are the countries dealing with lingering um, demand side issues now that states and localities are reopening, and and possibly the question, you know, the crystal ball question is is whether we think that the biggest part of the worst part of the crisis is over. <laughs> when we, this is where this is where we both pull out our crystal balls and play yeah. with them. Yeah. And the first one is very interesting to understand. What's the situation right now in the U.S. in that front? Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say the crystal ball is not pretty right now. Um, uh, we, we've this has been a pretty bad week in the U.S. in terms of um, the trends on the public health side. So uh, Wednesday, yesterday. Uh, the United States reported just over 50,000 new coronavirus cases. So that's, that's the largest single day total since the start of the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, our, our infectious disease expert, our top infectious disease expert, Anthony Fauci, who's become sort of a celebrity here in the United States during this crisis, has you know, basically indicated that those rising case numbers are at least partially uh, attributable to the fact that lockdown measures uh, have been more lenient here uh, than in some European countries, uh, you know, that have since managed to turn the tide on the virus. So, so not uh, not good news uh, on the public health side. Um, so, a little bit a little bit hard to uh, I, th I think say, um, but I'll, I'll just I'll offer a few thoughts. So, one one of the big questions here in the United States, um, particularly particularly if, um, uh, if we need to go back into lockdown mode, is what happens to that uh, $600 per week supplement for UI? Because that has really, uh, UI is unemployment insurance. So if, if that $600 per week uh, supplement uh, goes away, that's going to create great distress for, um, for individuals who uh, are out of work, their families. It's also going to create great um, distress for the economy. Uh, because of what it will do to uh, to consumer spending to to the demand side, so that is going to be, I, I think, a very difficult thing to um, to calibrate, right? P particularly if we have these phases of kind of reopening and lockdown, reopening and lockdown. How do you sort of calibrate these major government expenditures and public policies, you know, with a um, that are, that that involve a lot of negotiation and long term thinking with uh, a public health um, crisis that needs to be you know, managed in a much more finely tuned uh, sort of way. That is, I, I think, a really uh, big challenge. Um, you know, I, I guess a, a couple other thoughts is that, you know, it, it, we should we should talk about what what uh, what economists are uh, expecting and what what we expect to see uh, happen here in the United States. I, I think all of this is probably should be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt in general, but maybe a big grain of salt now, because. Um, uh, because of the, the bad news I just uh, shared with you guys about the public health uh, concerns. But um, uh, at the beginning of June, roughly 70% of economists uh, that were surveyed expected what's now being called sort of a, a, a Nike swoosh uh, recovery, where you have kind of a sharp, uh, sharp downturn in, uh, in, in, in Q2 with a uh, kind of a steady recovery uh, beginning uh, after that starting in, in the third quarter. Uh, we, we did get some nice surprises, uh, particularly in May on the, on the economic side, uh, where we, we, we were not expecting to see job growth in May. We were not expecting to see unemployment uh, decline in May, but we saw both of those things happen in May. That was great news. And uh, the jobs figures for the US just came out uh, uh, in the last 24 hours or so. Uh, so we've seen continued strong economic growth uh, here uh, in, in the month of June. The question is, you know, is that going to continue uh, now that uh, we're seeing uh, a rise in 
uh, in infections. Um, I, should, I should mention that as we look at that job growth, the biggest gains have been in the places where we needed them, or at least where the biggest losses were in the leisure and hospitality sector, so, so restaurants and hotels, but there was a huge decline in local government employment. So, so the stress that I mentioned earlier in local government, these are your teachers, these are your uh, firemen, these are your police officers, these are the people who uh, who maintain and build uh, infrastructure. Um, those, um, uh, we, we saw 600,000 uh, new people unemployed uh, coming out of local government um, uh, in, in the month of June. That, that is very uh, worrying in, in many, many ways. Um, another thing to worry about here as we think about um, as we think about uh, these issues is when you break down the, 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 these, these recent trends that I just mentioned, e even though overall um, uh, unemployment is going down, at least for the month of May, we saw that uh, unemployment for African Americans was, uh, was still going up. That's concerning. Another concern is that when you look at the breakdown of the nature of unemployment, um, I'm not sort of an expert on this, but um, you know, there's different classifications for those who are permanently unemployed, temporarily unemployed. We're seeing our temporary unemployment numbers go down pretty sharply, which is good news. More concerning is that the permanently unemployed numbers uh, continue to go up. And so what that means is that by, by my estimates, this is very rough. I, I anticipate, if you believe these forecasts, that we're going to see on the order of 10 million Americans who are sort of uh, out of work for a period of probably uh, a year or two, uh, unless there's a major intervention uh, to get those folks back into um, uh, an employed status, back into jobs. So um, it, it is um, a very uncertain, but I think even, even um, if you, um, you know, sort of take the most promising data that's out there, I think it suggests that we're still going to have some big problems on our hands for at least a couple of years to come. Yeah, I, I, I pick up on one, one of the things you said is uh, one of the major uh, conclusions that we can draw now is that uh, the level of uncertainty around economic growth, uh, if you look at, at the predictions of economists, whether it's the IMF or the EU or, or, or banks or, or independent economists, um, is much larger than it was during the crisis 10 years ago. Yeah. So the ability, the consensus around uh, what is the economic outlook is much more difficult to build today than it was 10 years ago. And that, that could be a surprise, uh, but it also has an impact on, on possibly how people behave. Because if there's a perception that there's not only a decline in growth, but an, an increase in uncertainty it, it might impact people's behavior, notably their ability and willingness to spend. So we might end up in a situation where people actually save more mm. because the environment is, is even more uncertain than it was 10 years ago. Um, what we've also seen in, in Europe, and I'm, I'm broadening the topic to, to outside of France, is um, actually uh, we've, see, we've seen quite a lot of pickup in May and June around economic growth. It doesn't mean that it's better than 2019, but it means that it's not as as depressed as as was expected even a month and a half ago. And we see that a number of, of, of indicators, you have obviously growth, but you have more immediate imme indicators like uh, we've seen a pickup in bank card transactions, mm -hmm. very steep pickup in, in card transactions, which is a clear indication that there has been uh, an, an increase in economic activity. Uh, I think that in, to a large extent, the, the consequences of of this crisis are will take time to 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 be felt first of all um and will take time to recover i mean it's it's quite it's quite obvious to say and so the crystal ball is is far from being clear um and also um i mean let's face it the, the virus is still around we're seeing areas in the world where 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 uh, contaminations are back and as a consequence, the possibility of a, another dip in certain parts of the world, certain regions, certain countries, is 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 not not um, uh, not impossible. So uh, I think it's extremely difficult to actually forecast uh, what what will come out of this. And what I what I kind of like to to also highlight is is the level of cooperation between the various players 
So if you put on, you know, around a table, um, the central government, uh, the municipalities and all the states and, and some of the big institutions like banks, the central bank and some of the large corporations, uh, what we've seen in Europe is, is, is different frameworks, different way of organizing things. Obviously, France is, is quite a centralized country, or at least has a centralized history, which means that coordination is actually probably easier mm. from an standpoint. Um, and possibly the U.S. or more decentralized systems have a bit more difficulty in, in coordinating. I, I suspect that's that's right. Um, so, you know, in the U.S. side, one of the biggest challenges of coordination is actually on the public health side, uh, because the primary authority for dealing with public health issues is at the subnational level. So, um, we're very dependent uh, in the United States on uh, the actions of states and localities to address public health crises. Um, creating coordination is is difficult in that respect, where you can see. You know, very different um, policies in place, you know, in one state versus another, even states that, that border uh, one another. Um, you know, on the, on the economic side, in terms of how, how we manage uh, uh, an economic crisis, um, most of the capacity for that is at the federal level. I mean, certainly at the federal level, that's where monetary policy is. But fiscally, um, particularly for a crisis of this magnitude, the federal government is really the only player um, uh, in terms of being, in terms of having the capacity um, uh, to reckon with a, with a magnitude uh, crisis like this. Um, in, in part because uh, at the state level, uh, you, states are required to have uh, balanced budgets. Um, virtually all, all states have to have uh, balanced budgets and cannot deficit spend. And so, um, ha having said that, um, many of um, Many of the federal uh, expenditures are flowing through states to um, uh, to get to their intended targets, particularly uh, particularly uh, unemployment insurance, which is uh, administered uh, by the states, but also also the wide range of of grants and other relief measures that go through state departments departments of agriculture and uh, uh, education, uh, social services, and so forth. Um, Another, uh, another really uh, interesting thing to consider here, I think, is, um, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I expect to see uh, something on the order of um, 10 million or so Americans who are um, unemployed for at least a few years as a result of, of this crisis. I mean, there's a real opportunity there if government takes enlightened action uh, to provide resources for for reskilling those people, helping them. I mean, these are these are you know low low wage, uh, low uh, uh, you know people who do not have university degrees. Um, a real opportunity for for retooling, for reskilling, enabling them to uh, to come back not just in jobs but in jobs that were better than those that they had uh, before. So, um, you know, that's going to require a, a lot of of coordinated action. Um, different levels of government to to achieve for sure but i do think that um you know there are some interesting opportunities that we might want to talk about as we think about what's next you know another one that comes to mind for me is um you know what what is what is the future of of telework and uh and what does that mean for uh, a couple of things one uh, it has i think profound implications for uh, commercial real estate. Um, <laughs> every, everybody I talked to uh, has, has told me that uh, the commercial real estate community is just freaking out right now uh, for, for uh, understandable reasons. But, but big implications for commercial real estate, that has big implications for, for cities, for downtowns. But also, um, this I think has big implications for the geography of jobs. Uh, when you think about, um, you know, most of the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, you know, so, so many of the big economic opportunities, um, you know, required moving to, um, to a handful of very large sort of, um, uh, you know, super metros, New York, DC, San Francisco, Paris. Um, if, if, you can, um, if you can have a great job uh, that you can do from the comfort of your own home, well, you know, you can do that in your home region, in your home state. Um, this could have some really interesting uh, implications in that uh, in that regard. And that's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. 
have you seen um, because in in European countries you you have um, unions and representatives of um, of management. Um, do you have which which are often in in in, in reasonably good dialogue with central government. Is that the same thing in the US? I.e. do you have a dialogue between central government uh, or at least a voice um, between central government and, and, and unions or representatives of, of corporations? How, how does that happen uh, in the US? You know, um, it's not a place where I'm an expert, but um, my sense is that it's, it's much less sort of structured um, than it is in um, in France and other parts of Europe. Um, you know, there, there's certainly um, a, a pathway for, uh, for for organized labor unions to, um, uh, uh, to, to engage, to lobby um, government officials. You know, you know, the, for in, in, in the United States political landscape, the um, the, the relationship between government and, and unions tends to be much stronger in the Democratic Party than, than in, the, in the Republican Party. With, um, you know, with Republicans in, in the White House or a Republican in the White House and also uh, Republicans controlling the United States Senate, um, um, I, I think that, that you know, plays a role uh, and probably you know, maybe diminishes uh, the level of interaction, although it's not a place where I'm sort of an expert. Yeah. Um, one one topic which you which you um, uh, start touching upon is is how we balance um, the various um, the various objectives uh, so the health necessities uh, jobs uh, and and the need to, to protect the environment um, I think that that's going to be one of the key topics or debates we're we're going to face and and we see that in countries which are started to get out of, of the lockdown, which is how do you balance those various uh, objectives? And, and I'm not sure that there's a, a perfect path or a perfect direction, uh, but clearly this is to me going to be um, one, of the, um, one of the debates we're going to have to face and one of the conundrums we possibly have to face. And, and clearly uh, what we have seen um, is Governments have had to focus on health as a as a sort of starting point because that was that was the immediate urgency. Um, there clearly is now a, a very strong focus on job preservation and protected companies, yeah. uh, but that's clearly building a, a a massive amount of 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 public debt and not only but also private debt. And so one of the areas where there is, in my view, quite a lot of expectations from the public. Um, uh, is is the environment and and striking the right balance uh, at a government level, uh, whether that's state or federal, between jump starting the economy, including sectors which have a significant carbon impact, like air travel, and at the same to uh, at the same time uh, responding to mounting concerns for the environment, is going to be is going to be a challenge and. Uh, we've seen uh, President Macron was a couple of days ago actually endorsing uh, close to 150 uh, measures in favor of the environment, which which was quite quite a very, very strong statement. Um, and I think that's that's one of the challenges we're we're going to have we're going to have to face. And and I'm ca also cognizant that the sensitivity uh, to to environmental protection may be different in Europe, in the U.S. Mm. and in the emerging world. Uh, but I do think that at least in Europe, there will be, there will be a significant demand for, for preserving the environment while at the same, while at the same time to start the economy. And I, I, I think that will really require a change of behaviors and change of consumer behavior, uh, which, and the role of governments there is, is, is not going to be insignificant. It's going to be, in my view, to actually encourage that change of behaviors, uh, like buying local, um, buying more durable goods, uh, redirecting your consumption towards carbon lighter uh, goods and services, and so on and so forth. And that's, that is, to me, something that is, in a sense, maybe are not as urgent, but actually equally important as, as jump-starting the economy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um... 
it is it is a slow motion crisis uh, for sure. Um, you know, um, I I think there's at least a couple thoughts that come to mind, uh, David. One is um, just building on what you said, and that is that um, the 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 massive government expenditure that was made to respond to to the COVID nineteen crisis. I think is likely going to um, create sort of an equal and opposite call for you know austerity measures going forward, putting government on a diet. Um, that's going to really constrain our ability um, to respond to some of the big things that governments ought to be investing in. Um, um, in, in the United States, we've seen um, in investments in, uh, in in infrastructure, in um, basic research, uh, scaled back uh, as a result of um, well, well, as a as a percent of, of of GDP, even before COVID, I think this, the 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 expenditures that were made, the the run up in, in government debt uh, as a result of this crisis, will um, create even greater uh, constraints in that respect. You know, certainly when you think about what it's going to take uh, to solve, uh, or even just to better manage uh, uh, our relationship with the climate, a huge part of that is, um, is, 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 is finding the right technology, building the right infrastructure. Um, that means a certain amount of government investment. It's going to be harder to make. Um, you know, secondly, I think it's, it's important to point out, point out that, you know, for industries that, um, uh, that make the case that it's hard for them to compete in the United States uh, because of environmental regulation, you know, the desire to see rapid growth is going to, I think, give those, you know, sort of claims greater uh, salience. In other words, like, hey, don't do this to us now because um, because we really need to keep these jobs here. We, we want to grow here. But, you know, if, if the environmental regulations are too um, stringent, um, we're not going to be able to do that. I think we'll hear, or at least uh, I think more of those uh, claims will be uh, being made uh, going forward. Yeah. One, uh, going also to, to some of the Q&As, I mean, we've, yeah. we've addressed one of the question around with the relationship with unions. Um, there was a there, there, there's a question around apart from the U.S. and France, have you seen countries that are able to deal with the crisis in the right way, while protecting even the most vulnerable in society? Uh, I mean, I think maybe I'll, I'll try to take that one. Um, I think a number of countries have actually reacted in a in a in a in a, in a good way, um, and and uh, at least if we look at 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 um, uh, you know, very structured economies with 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 a government that is able to step in, which don't not all countries have. Uh, I think you know in Europe, again, a lot of the countries have reacted in the same way. I'm citing Germany uh, as as one of them. Uh, one of the key takeaways is 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 to protect the most fragile. Uh, you basically had to do three things. First of all, you had you had to act fast. Um, and you had to act fast in preserving income and jobs, which a lot of countries have done through various forms of partial unemployment, uh, whereby the state took over the cost of, of, of what was basically partial or total unemployment. And mo many countries have done that. Uh, second, you had to preserve your, um, your SME networks, so either your basically the bulk of the economy is constituted of SMEs and they don't have the same access to credit, including not the same access to financial markets. So that's so why most countries have reacted very quickly there, whether that's France or Germany. Um, and, and, and then obviously you had to be able to respond to the health crisis um, to, to, to make sure, and to the social crisis to make sure that people still had access to health services, healthcare services, but also other services, and one 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 of them, you know, one that comes to mind as being paramount is is education, um, and the ability of countries to make sure that during this crisis, kids had access to education, uh, is to me one going to be one of the big differentiators in 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 creating equalities because. To be absolutely honest, if, if your, your parents are home and, and they're able to do homeschooling because they, they have the tools to do that, uh, because they have a separate room to work in and, and so on and so forth, you're actually going to go through, through, uh, conf through the lockdown and okay-ish. 
uh, if that's not the case, then, then actually as, as a child, uh, you will lose two or three months of education, which, which is huge over a year. So I think the, the ability of the school system to be able to maintain a good level of, of interaction with kids, uh, with parents as well, and make sure that, uh, that children were having uh, a good or at least a decent amount of education through, through that period is going to be a big differentiator between countries who have been able to tackle mounting inequalities and, 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 and countries who, who have not been able to do that. I, I completely agree with that um, and, and was thinking along similar lines. Another, another big thought that comes to mind in this regard is um, I think in, in most countries you are going to see a certain amount of, of permanent unemployment or at least you know, long-term unemployment uh, coming from this crisis. Uh, that's certainly true here in the U.S. Um, for countries that have strong social safety nets to you know, help uh, uh, support uh, those vulnerable folks and, and get them back into uh, productive work, uh, obviously that's going to have a big impact as well. There, there are so many uh, negative, um, profoundly negative impacts of long-term uh, unemployment you know, from, from, from health uh, to, um, to you know, other socioeconomic uh, ills. So um, that is going to be, I think, a big thing to watch uh, as well. We've got, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, how do you think Around the U.S. elections, right? Yeah. That's for you. How do you think this crisis will affect uh, the U.S. elections? Uh, okay, I hope all of you have your pen and paper ready. Uh, here's the answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, obviously, um, it, it's 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 a little bit it's you know impossible to say exactly, but um, I'll, I'll make um, I'll make a, a couple of points here. Um, one, um, the you know the, the the overall health and direction of the economy uh, has you know uh, you know uh, made uh, major impacts uh, statistically on. Uh, the outcome of U.S. elections. So I think, you know, in part, um, you know, it's going to depend on, you know, how things are looking um, uh, over, over the next uh, several months. I think, um, you know, a, a, a better economy would, you know, tend to, to help uh, the, the incumbent. Um, uh, I think the more things decline, I think that's going to play to, uh, to Biden's favor. Um, I, I would also, I would also say that I think to a certain degree, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say, I think it's hard to, to know exactly how um, the, the Trump administration's um, uh, performance in, in crisis management is going to be um, uh, rendered. And, and let me explain that. I think I think for for folks who um, for, for who are already um, you know inclined to uh, you know support uh, Biden or or to or, or to vote against Trump, I think it's very clear how they're rendering it um, overwhelmingly negative negatively but you know the, I, I think the question is um, you know will it be framed in a way um, for folks who are maybe otherwise inclined to support Trump uh, uh, in, a, in a way that might uh, peel some some support off of him so I mean that's uh, you know th that's a big one I mean the other the other you know thing to consider is it, it is possible that we may still be in some form of, of a lockdown uh, in November and obviously just when you consider the, the practicality of voting, um, the, the U.S. is a is a country that has um, uh, that has not done you know widespread um, uh, mail-in uh, voting uh, in, in America. The vast majority of voters you know still still go to the polls, um, and so um, you know the, the the lockdown will create some really interesting uh, uh, dynamics uh, in that respect if, um, uh, if 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 it's still uh, ongoing in November. Yeah, do, because um, Trump has has had a very stable um, base of voters since his elections, around forty percent, um, which which uh, honestly had had not really changed until very recently. Uh, but we've seen a bit of an erosion there, uh, at least at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, is that is that something that that's continuing or or? sort of going back to, to, to the previous situation. Yeah. So I don't, I don't follow the polls super closely, but, um, but I have looked at some polls uh, more recently. And the ones that I think are most important to look at are the, are the, are the uh, polls in the battleground states. Uh, for those of you who you know, are familiar with the U.S. electoral system, you'll, you'll, or electoral college, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So you know, really looking closely at the, um, 
at, at, at the states that are you know sort of close to sort of a 50-50 uh, matchup. Um, the latest polls I've seen suggest that um, that Biden's uh, uh, performance uh, has significantly improved in the polls in many battleground states. So um, I think at this point, you know, reading sort of the polls, the tea leaves, I think there's um, um, a lot of a lot to be optimistic about for folks who are in the Biden camp. Uh, a lot of things to be worried about uh, if you're in the Trump camp right now, given uh, given how this crisis is playing out. Yeah. I don't know if we have uh, whether we have uh, further further questions from uh, uh, from uh, the uh, from the crowd and from attendees. Um, we're we're approaching the, our time limit anyway. Oh, here's here's another question. Yeah, it's from from Bama. Um, how do you think the recent immigration restriction will um, will impact the economy? I'm, ass I'm assuming, Bama, you mean uh, U.S. immigration restriction. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's on honestly hard to say, but um, you know, certainly, um, you know, when you when you draw up a list of of the many significant issues that need um, attention and and, and resolution. Uh, in the United States and issues that have been, um, uh, you know, I think sort of, um, you know, not, you know, handled in a um, sort of, sort of a comprehensive long-term enlightened way, <laughs> um, um, you know, immigration is un undoubtedly um, on, on the list. And, and um, I would say that, you know, it has, um, you know, at least, uh, at least a, a, a few impacts. I mean, one, one, of course, uh, there, there are many, uh, um, jobs in America, um, particularly low, low, low skill, low wage jobs, where it's um, uh, very difficult to uh, uh, to, to get um, U U.S. citizens in, into those jobs, where our economy really depends on on immigrants. So I think economically, you have that. Um, you know, on the sort of more uh, sophisticated side of the economy, um, you know, we are missing out on. Uh, a, a lot of talent uh, that can be um, that could help fuel innovation uh, and, and growth uh, in America because of the way we've uh, handled immigration more broadly. You know, also I think you know one of the things that we have to consider is um, you know when 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 the rest of the world looks at how you know America is is responding to this crisis. You know, generally we're on a particular issue like immigration. I think uh, I think that um, you know how, how we act has has a lot to do. With U.S. standing in the world, and so I, I, it concerns me in that respect as well. Um, I don't know whether we have, uh, yeah, further further questions from uh, from the audience. Um, I think not. So maybe we'll, let, let's let's. Uh, I think we'll actually are pretty much done. With the with the allocated time, so unless there's there's follow up questions from um, from the audience, I'd I'd really like to thank again, first of all, you, Jason, because it was a, a pleasure to talk to you again. Likewise, I'd really like to thank the the FAF for for organizing this uh, this uh, webinar on both sides of the Atlantic, um, and also I'd like to to thank and say hi to everyone who's uh, who's attended. It's always a always a pleasure to be um, to be with our friends at, at FAF. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll give the floor back to, uh, to Katie, uh, and, oh, thanks. Hi, Megan. How are you doing? Um, so, uh, so I, I'd probably give the floor back to Katie, but, but I'm sure that Jason, before you want to say, say a few words before, before we part ways. I, I just want to echo those sentiments, David. It's been such a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I want to thank the FAF community, uh, wherever you are, uh, for, um, uh, for this opportunity. It's so good to be together with you guys. My, uh, I, I've got many wishes uh, uh, for this uh, as, we, as we conclude. Wishes for certainly public health, wishes for our economy, but also wish that, uh, that we can be together in person again soon. Um, I miss all of you and um, hope you're well. And uh, very nice to be with you like this today, but hoping that we can uh, do it with less social distancing next time. Thank you so much, David and Jason, for a really insightful conversation. Um, uh, just a note that we are going to be pausing our Young Leaders Perspectives webinars for the summer season, but we are still going to have a few uh, foundation webinars with outside speakers. 
the next foundation webinar with an outside speaker will be held on July 15th uh, at 1 p.m. with General Wesley Clark, the retired general of the U.S. Army and the former Supreme Allied Commander Europe of NATO. So thank you very much again uh, for, for this excellent webinar. Take care. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.